Welcome to the Rhythms Podcast from Everwell Church in Orange County, California. This podcast is a resource that explores the unforced rhythms of grace found in following Jesus. Each rhythm is intended for discussion within community as a way to spur spiritual growth and breakthrough through the power of the Holy Spirit. This podcast is with Dr. Jerry Tallow from Anchored Ministry on the Rhythm of Scripture. Anchored is a ministry dedicated to securing leaders to the strength of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Jerry, for being with us today. This is a super excited to have you here. And then talking about the unforced rhythms of Jesus found in the Word of God. And coincidentally, we are going to be talking about the scripture, the sacred scripture of Jesus. So thank you so much for doing this rhythm with us. So I think right off the bat, we're going to have to talk about this burning question. What is scripture and why does the Bible matter? That's burning and big, Josh. (laughs) (laughs) I would say this from a helicopter view, The Holy Scriptures are the Creator God's written revelation of Himself to His creation, including to His created beings that show His redemptive plan for them based on the created order He made and how it works. It is the ultimate authority in life which is hard for a lot of people to swallow. Now, a lot of surveys show that church-going Christians, do the majority, sometimes struggle with the fact that the Bible is the ultimate authority in their lives. So they look horizontally and seek other sources. But it is heaven's food to Mm -hmm. us. It's not a to-do manual. I think that's what drives some people away. It is the basis for all reality. It comes from the scriptures. It doesn't matter what subject matter you're talking about, you'll find it in there. Mm -hmm. So it is God revealing himself ultimately through his son in this magnificent epic that would be the greatest streaming series in the history of life. (laughs) Absolutely. Why would you say it matters? Again, this goes back to your faith. If I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, Mm -hmm. and he says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So he's speaking both temporally and eternally there. If Jesus is doubling down on it, continually tying his actions to it is written, referring back to the Old Testament, this is his revelation and the scriptures change your life from the inside out. Mm -hmm. I believe we'll be talking about that in a few minutes, Mm -hmm. but that probably matters more than anything. We are, you and I are free right here to have this podcast and you can produce it and publish it and send it out because we live in a nation that once upon a time had these principles of the core values of representation in scripture in their souls and in their minds. Mm -hmm. So even the formula of our nation was based on the wisdom of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So if you are a faith walking follower of Christ and you do not see the Bible as your ultimate authority, one of your gods that will visit you every day is humanism. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm -hmm. a killer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's funny too, because I see humanism piggyback on Christian values all the time and acting like it's its own, which is a travesty. Well, let's get into this. What about scripture study? So this is about scripture study, Um, studying the Word of God, why does Scripture study separate itself from the other spiritual disciplines? You and I are both married men, and the Scriptures tell us that the two shall become one flesh. Have you been ever able to scientifically explain that to another human being, how you and your wife are one flesh? Perfectly. I've done it. (laughs) Have you ever been able to completely, with diagrams and logic, explain the Trinity? The incarnation, the virgin birth. So there are mysteries in life. There is a mystery. I probably should have prefaced this whole thing with this. The word of God has a life of its own. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what scripture study does, it renews your mind from the inside out. When I was in college, 
when I actually made class, my mind was affected by what I was hearing up front, whether it was statistics or marketing, it didn't matter. But when you're reading the scriptures, it is the spirit in you connecting with the logos, the word of God that is made flesh. And those reform you in your thinking and over time completely transform you. I want to read you one scripture that Paul really doubles down on here. I just love his letters to, to Timothy, his son in the faith. And he was talking about Timothy's love for the old writings, meaning the Old Testament, of course. And then he goes on to say this. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for, listen to this, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. The only thing Paul ever said such a statement about is the holy word of God. Not good counsel, not good fellowship, not good worship. Do we need those? Absolutely because we're born for community. We're born to live in covenant. But the word of God is the only thing that is inside of us Mm -hmm. through the Holy Spirit. And interesting, that word, the man or woman of God, also means the messenger. So the message actually transforms the messenger into becoming a messenger. And I've lost count of the times I have said to people, Josh, over 40 plus years of ministry now, I must be getting old, that the greatest thing they can do is read scripture, read it aloud, read it aloud with their wives. It's transformative. And people just don't seem to have time for the greatest gift on earth. Mm. Yeah. Well, what do you think are the different ways that scripture can be practiced or be a rhythm that kind of takes over the dance of their lives, whether it might be like reading, meditation, study, memorization. What has it been like for you? I don't know if you can read without study. Like when you're on an airplane, you're, well, back when paperbacks were on planes instead of Kindle, everybody would stop at the local store in the airport and buy uh, Vince Flynn or uh, David Baldacci novel, the latest thriller, yeah. right? But you had to really engage your mind to follow some of these guys who I have my favorite authors, and man, they go deep in explaining, for example, the mind of a criminal and how do they deal with it and and the philosophy behind it and so on. These guys do their research. If you're reading it casually, you're not going to be tracking with them, right? Same principle in the Holy Scriptures. If we simply read, we're going to come across what I call Passover verses. In other words, there's a verse that I really struggle with, so I'm going to pass over that because I don't know what the heck it means or I don't like what it means, Mm. For, for example, Paul, Paul pulled no punches. He said to Timothy, well, look, it was the woman who was deceived, not the man in the garden. That doesn't always preach well, yeah. right? And that's I'm a, actually going to do a series on that. Perfect, so. I'll yeah. help you. It's a Passover verse because, A, people don't understand it, and B, it sounds so offensive in a, a modern egalitarian humanist culture where the human soul is the center of all things. We just don't want to touch it. So we move on. I don't see how you can read without some sense of study, which means, and we'll get into this, understanding the basic principles of reading and interpreting scripture, and they are not complicated. The Bible was never designed to be complicated. It doesn't mean it's an easy life, but it's not a secret code book that only a few people on planet Earth can decipher. I saw a movie with Tom Hanks. I think, is it the Da Vinci Code? No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great doctrine, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I guess I'm a holistic thinker, right? The Hebrew mind never thought in terms of lists. Like, okay, today I'll read, tomorrow I'll study, Thursday I'll meditate. You need to do it all. It needs to be a package deal. Mm-hmm. And when you are reading, because the Word of God is alive and something... People use the phrase, that scripture jumped out at me, even though I've read it 20 times before. If it jumps out, it's because God wants you to meditate on it, to ruminate on it, to think on it in points during the day, and maybe dig a little deeper and research it to find out what the heck it means. Well, one of the things that I love about you, Jerry, is that you are a creature of the word, Mm -hmm. that 
you feasted on this thing and now it's become a part of you. And I just, I don't see a lot of people memorizing and hiding God's word in their heart. Why, why do you think that is? If there is not a hunger for the word of God, and that is tied to a general lack of the fear of the Lord in the Christian culture now, but how do I develop an appetite for a particular food? I need to eat that food, right? So, for example, my wife has been training me for all these years to eat things that I don't think I should be eating, like cauliflower, mm. right? I used to tell her that cauliflower came after the curse, the fall, not before. <laughs> So she said, how about if I disguise it? I said, yeah, you better really disguise it. Well, the other day I had cauliflower disguised as rice, mm. mm -hmm. right? And of course, I put a lot of cayenne pepper on it. Yeah. But now I'm eating that and I have developed a taste for it. God bless that cauliflower rice. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you don't wake up in the morning, the day after Christ converts your soul and say, oh, I have this voracious hunger to understand everything about the word of God. Some people do. That's not often how it happens. You develop the appetite because, again, once you get into it, you don't know what it's doing. So does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. So there is such brilliance in there, and, and for me, for me, the effect it has had on my life is so profound that I, I just used to rely on what we called the spirit. Who knew what spirit it was floating around? Mm -hmm. I have a charismatic background. I am now a firm believer in sound doctrine and life of the spirit, a healthy balance. And that's who Jesus was, so it's a good example. Right. And so, well, the spirit led me to do this. God told me to do that. And whenever someone would use the God told me card, I'd say, all right, game over. We're done talking. I'm not going to counsel you on this because you're just not teachable. Mm. So if you let the word of God teach you, if you go into it with that attitude of humility, it will change your life. And mm. for me, Romans, the book of Romans, I started reading it, grew up in a hardcore Italian Catholic family, quite insecure when Jesus saved me, trying to prove myself, wonder what others think, beat myself up after preaching. Oh, I shouldn't have said that and so on. And then I'm realizing, wait a minute, I am dead in my sin. I am totally lost without Christ. I bring nothing to the table. Jesus, as the new Adam, rose me up from death, and now I reign with him. And then if that wasn't enough after my conversion, he has imputed to me his righteousness. So I have this righteous standing before God forever, no matter what I do. And, and then on top of that, Romans 8, he adopted me as his heir. Right? This changed my life. Not somebody's counseling, not a prayer meeting, the book of Romans. And mm -hmm. I read verses 1 through 8 so many times. Mm -hmm. Just kept reading it, mm -hmm. Josh. It is transforming. Oh, that's so good. So good. Well, you kind of made mention to that, but I think we should go to this. What posture should we take when studying scripture? Like, how do we know when God is speaking to us? You made mention of that, of like, well, God told me. Well, one of the ways that God speaks to us is through his written logos, his word. Correct. How, how do we know that it stopped being me reading something that God was saying to Paul or to the Ephesians, and it started speaking straight into my life? Right. I think this goes back to people being ignorant. I don't mean that in a negative way, just not necessarily aware of the basic rules of interpretation. And you're, if you're training for a sport, let's say you're a hitter. My youngest son plays baseball, and he's had extensive training in hitting. He goes up there, and he follows a process, and he has learned by following the rules that he was taught, the principles that are time-honored, how to self-correct and how to recognize the situation, what is working, what isn't. I use that as a, a bit of a, an analogy here. Let me just give a few quick pointers here. And this would really help someone know if God is speaking to them through the scriptures. First of all, when you're reading a chapter of the Bible, you have to know the context of the passage. 
What chapter is it in the book? What book is it? What was the author's intent and purpose? If you don't know those, I guarantee you probably a third of the scriptures in that particular book will not do anything to you, for you, or in you because you won't get it. Mm -hmm. right? You have to know the intent. You have to know the literary form. That is huge. And with the nation circling the drain, you got a lot of prognosticators predicting this is the end of the world. And they'll take half of one verse out of context, see what the newspapers are saying or the news feeds, and create a doctrine around it, build a chart, sell books, hold rallies for the end of the world. But if you understand the literary form and if something is symbolic you're not going to translate it or interpret it as literal. Simple example, the Song of Solomon. Commentators debate, is it a love story between two people? Is it Jesus and his bride? Is it something else? It may be all of them, right? Since people smarter than me don't agree, I'm not going to lay my hat down on one thing. But in one chapter, I want to say it's chapter four, the guy is writing this love letter to the girl, and and he tells her that her... Her teeth are like shorn sheep. (laughs) Say that 10 times fast. Exactly. (laughs) And and her breasts are like the the fawns running in the field. Yeah. Valentine's Day is around the corner. You probably don't want to buy a card with that in it. Yeah. Right? So clearly the author there, the Song of Solomon, is not uh, writing something literally. This this whole thing is a love poem. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you have to read it as that and therefore interpret it properly. Yeah. And I'm always amazed when people listen to poets, they're always looking for the deeper meaning, and rightfully so. Mm-hmm. But we don't do that in the Bible. Once you know the literary form, it actually gets simpler. And then the, the two basic rules that you know, Josh, and, yeah. and I just want to say for the people listening, I pay a lot of attention to Josh's preaching, and he is biblically sound in following the rules of what are called hermeneutics and homiletics. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So number one, context. Number two, literary form. Number three, scripture must interpret scripture. Mm. Mm-hmm. Another example, Matthew 24, when uh, the disciples had asked Jesus, what are the signs of the end that you're talking about coming? And he was talking about the destruction of Jerusalem in chapter 23, God's judgment on them. And uh, later on in the chapter, he says, and the, the sun will turn dark and the moon will turn to blood. Well, there are people saying that's actually going to happen. So you have an obscure passage there. All you need to do is let the obvious explain the obscure. In other words, where else in the Bible are the sun and moon mentioned in such terms that could be symbolic? And if you go back to what Isaiah wrote about Egypt, when the the civil leaders fell, the national leaders were falling because of God's judgment coming on the nation during a collapse, what he was saying was the sun and the moon are falling. And so th- that th- the sun and the moon symbolically means seats of authority there. Mm. So if you were to just read it and say, oh, wow, well, I got better watch out if we ever see the sun get dark and it's all over, which, by the way, if the sun gets dark, it is all over. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you won't even be able to think after that. Yeah, but you won't be able to see either because it means Jesus is coming <laughs> yeah. back and he is the light. Yes. It's not complicated. Right. If, if people would simply follow these things, here's what would happen to your question. God would speak to them. And you know how he speaks? You have understanding when you're reading the scripture. Mm. And when you have understanding, then you can have proper application. Oh, I'm going through this at work. This is what that means here. This is what I should be doing then. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's so, that's so uncomplicated. It really is. We we have our ways of making things complicated. What do you think about the Bible is a library of books? There are stories and narratives. There are prophetic books. Mm -hmm. There are people's mail, letter to (laughs) Ephesus, letter to Philippi. There's just different, it's a a library, but it's all about one single meta-narrative, one major story, creation, fall, family of Israel, Redemption through Jesus Christ. 
and then the consummation where heaven and earth become one. If people knew that context, how would that change their lives? I, well, I think it it gives you a greater appreciation for and hunger for the Holy Scriptures when you realize you just answered your own question. Yeah, sorry about that. No, I loved it. It's better <laughs> than I would have done. That's it right there. We're talking about the continuity of the covenants from Adam through David in the Old Testament to the cross, it is one story. It is about one event, that cross, right? So in the Old Testament, in all the various types of books, the prophetic, the poetic, the narratives, the letters, the stories, and in the, in the, in the Old Testament, you're looking forward to Jesus. In the New, you're looking backwards to the cross, right? I mean, it is not complicated. Mm -hmm. And and. Why did God choose so many different forms of literature, Josh? I think to show us how complete the scripture is and, and so that we're, we take a holistic view of the word of God. It doesn't matter what literary form, you will find it in here. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And, and, and with that beauty, I really like this next question because where do we see scripture play in the life of Jesus? What moves you about how Jesus approached the word of God? How does that move you of just mm -hmm. how does the word of God become flesh, humbles himself under the Holy Scripture? What do you think about that? <laughs> well, it makes me want to get on my knees. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I think about it. You're, we're, on, we're treading on holy ground with a question like this, Josh. Mm -hmm. When you read the Gospels and, and read them with the intent of really seeing Jesus in them, I mean, who is he as fully God and fully man? That fully man side is really what you're looking for in the way he lived life. There is a humble reverence in him that breeds this incredible peace about him being his father's son that he delights in front of others in the scriptures and doesn't care what anybody thinks. When David was bringing the ark back to the covenant and when your father-in-law says to you or potential father-in-law, he's the king, I've got, I'll give you my daughter, just go give me a hundred foreskins of the Philistines <laughs> and you come back with 200. I'm not sure that's a good plan, but Mikkel despised David and he was kind of in a loincloth dancing, worshiping the Lord. And it's, it's a good picture uh, of a type there when that was happening, the total inhibition of a spirit in oneness with their father, God, mm. right? In human terms, that was Jesus every day. I, I, I am just amazed at the, the courage and backbone he had so calmly looking at the Pharisees who were the culture masters of the day, which much, with much more power, not just authority, but power to kill than we see in today's masters. He didn't even flinch because he had such reverence for the scriptures. We don't know if he knew in human form if he was the Logos. Mm. I mean, I think he did. He said, I am the bread of life. Mm -hmm. Whoever eats of me will never perish. So he meant his words, but he himself is the Logos, that mystery we can't figure out. So it was, it's a mind blower that the word of God had a humble reverence for the word of God that he would never do anything without making sure it is written. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, no, I, I think so. I, I think the, the follow-up to that is when he went out in his, after the spirit came down like a dove mm -hmm. and he went to the desert and the tempter came to him. Yeah. What do you think about how he just speaks, not just his own words, but he just takes full command and wields the sacred scriptures against the evil one. Probably the greatest example of the word of God being the sword of the Lord mm. in scripture. What do I think about it? I doubt I would have done that. Mm. I'd be yelling at the devil, <laughs> tell him, go back to hell where you came from. I rebuke you in Jesus' name, yada, yeah. yada, yada. Right. And he'd laugh at me. But it shows there. Here's the thing. It shows there how all of the created order is subservient to the Holy Scriptures, mm -hmm. including the created being Satan and mm -hmm. his kingdom. 
Jesus knew this, so he brought the ultimate weapon. Mm. And he didn't bring that ultimate weapon to gain or claim something, but rather to confront falsehood and lies and overthrow evil. Mm. His his motive was redemptive, not self-gain. Mm. I love that. I love that. Well, let's go. We just talked about the second person of the Trinity when mm. it involves scripture, but let's move to the third person. What role does the Holy Spirit play in reading and studying the Bible? Since after all, it was the thing that wrote and inspired Correct. the authors to read. So there has to be some sort of yeah. play here. So we go back to those mysteries of scripture, Mm -hmm. how the word of God has a spirit life of its own. Let me read to you from Ephesians 4. It's interesting. The author is appealing to the Hebrews to come to a place of rest, Mm -hmm. to cease from your works. Doesn't mean, I mean, he didn't mean stop working and making good money, Mm -hmm. but those works to prove myself before God self-justification so he said let us strive in chapter 4 verse 11 to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience so now he's showing us how you don't fall into the trap that so many did from unbelief or cynicism i mean i have friends that have turned from the word of god because of cynicism Mm -hmm. right For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, his, the spirit, Mm. but are all naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So when I open my Bible... Sandy and I read every morning. We're going through Corinthians right now. There are three of us there, me, her, and the Holy Spirit. Mm. And this word has a life of its own. This word renews you. This word transforms you from the inside out. This word heals your mind. And so can I tell you one quick story? Yeah, please. Okay, I've done probably over 350 weddings in 40 plus years of of ministry. That's a lot of weddings. Mm. Anyway, I always tell the young couple the importance of the word of God in their home. Say, look, this will save you a ton of misery, conflict, money on marriage counselors, you name it. Keep the scriptures alive between you. Did this one wedding long time ago, great couple, good young man and he came to me a few months later saying they call me doc doc you know so and so and i or we're having some problems i said already i mean (laughs) aren't you still on the honeymoon Mm. well i i won't go into detail here but i asked him one question tell me are you and your wife reading the scriptures together and he gave me that faith-based answer well i've been meaning to excuse my sarcasm Mm -hmm. there which means i haven't been meaning to Mm. right I said, look, all I'm going to say to you is what I told you in premarital counseling. Do you think I did that just because we had to go through the motions? Start reading the Bible out loud with your wife. At the end of the chapter, pray. Do a little cross-referencing. It's about all I told him. Probably three weeks later after a service, he came out to me, so you're not going to believe this. And I'm smiling. I said, let me guess. Things are a little better. He said, you wouldn't believe it. We're back on our honeymoon. I said, what made the difference? He said, I don't know. I mean, it's like we started reading the Bible and all of a sudden we're on the same page. Mm. It has a power Mm. of its own. Yeah. And this is where you cannot just believe in Jesus. When the Holy Spirit empowers you, you believe Jesus. In other words, you believe what he is saying to you. As his word is speaking to your soul, you believe it, you take it in. You embrace it. It works on you, maybe unto repentance, maybe unto change, maybe unto inspiration, Mm -hmm. all the things Timothy talked about. So you could kind of say, to get on the same page, you need to read the same book, (laughs) right? Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I'll be here all day. Yeah, this is fun. All right. Well, uh, let's get a little 
bit closer to home of what this rhythm is really about, Mm -hmm. which is why is devotional and corporate scripture study important in following Jesus? Why is this so important? We are all born with high degrees of self-deception. My pastor said each of us has enough self-deception in us to last us a lifetime. Therefore, you never really know yourself, right? And if you're just reading the scriptures on your own, your mirror is going to have fog in it. Ephesians 4, Paul says that Jesus ascended and he gave gifts to the church apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastor, and teacher. For what? For the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So there are men like yourself, Josh, that are gifted in excavating and delivering the Holy Word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to dramatically affect lives. I'm not a big fan even of the word devotion. Like if I'm going to have my devotion time, does that mean the rest of the day I'm not devoted to Christ? Mm. Again, I'm a little cynical. I understand. I just call it Bible time. But I continually, I work with a lot of churches out here, right? But I continually study under men who are much smarter than I am, guys older than me, some of my favorite people out there in their interpretation of scripture and what they're doing because I don't know what self-deception I have in me Mm, because I'm deceived about that area. And if I just do it alone, I'm not going to know. It's sometimes good to read some dead guys. Because they are the best. they don't they don't want anything from you anymore. They're the best. Um, they have no skin in the game. Exactly. All right. Well, that's amazing. So let's get even more practical. How should we approach scripture practically? What does that look like for you? Should we look at the Bible as a medicine cabinet that we only go there because we want the one verse to if, if I feel sad, make me happy verse? Or should we look at it? as something that is doing work in our lives, transforming me, and really taking a deep look into it? I know that was a big question. I choose door number two. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And it goes back to what we discussed earlier, the continuity of the covenants. This is a tough one for people because when you... If, if you can embrace the reality that the Bible is one story, like you said, in f- different literary forms, but always pointing toward Jesus, mm. and you do your homework when you are reading the scriptures. So if you're going to read a, a book of the Bible, take the time and read the introduction. Mm. Why was it written? To whom was it written? What was the culture like at the time? What was the author's intent? And who are the main, what are the main themes in it? If you have a halfway decent study Bible and anyone from Everwell should ask Josh what he recommends, because mm. I know it'll be excellent, that will help you so much when you're reading that book of the Bible to understand the why of it mm-hmm. being written and how it then points to Jesus. Mm. I don't know if that's a good answer there, but it's not a field manual. Mm-hmm. It is the food of God. It's the food of God. So saying it's like the food of God, um, how do you prepare your food? What does it look like just for Dr. Jerry Tallow to sit down with the word of God, whether it's Bible time in the morning, mm-hmm. what does that look like? So I have a large Bible that's not, I don't carry with me. That's my study Bible. The, the heathen fear this book. That, <laughs> that, that's how big it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I think it's the, the best study and reference Bible I have ever seen. And so I use that regularly. I'll cross-reference, I'll have, I'm not a fan of using my phone for Bible study, but I'll, I'll use, get tri- different translations. I take it quite seriously, so I put the time aside, and I say, all right, for these next 30 minutes, this is what we're going to do. Mm. And so those are my simple tools. There is a study guide I will use from my favorite the American theologian. I'll mention him later. Mm-hmm. And it's not a devotional because it provokes you all the time. It's an actual study through books of the Bible. Mm-hmm. So I'm constantly doing that. And so when you're doing that, you have context from Monday through Friday and you're building the story of the narrative of that particular book. And then I will on a separate journal log, whatever it is God is working in me versus what God is showing me for Mm. public ministry. 
All right. No, that's good. That's really good. What roles do repetition, concentration, comprehension, reflection, uh, play in Bible study in a world that is constantly just scrolling through 15-second mm. things? We don't really need to concentrate because we're so distracted on little things. So what do you think when you grab onto the Word of God, or m- more probably accurately, when the, gra- when, when the Word of God grabs you, how do you concentrate? How do you use repetition that you see in Scripture, comprehension, reflection, play? One of the forms of interpretation, when you see repetition in Scripture, the biggest one being Isaiah 6, when Isaiah, the most powerful man in Israel, a noble, saw the Lord Hmm. in the temple. Actually, he saw the train of his temple, (laughs) and he heard the seraphim saying the Tris Agion, holy, 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 the only time any descriptive words of God are given three times. And then he said, woe is me, I'm coming apart at the seams, Mm. right? I'm no good. Mm. When you come across things that are repetitive in Scripture, in Proverbs you'll see a lot of it. It might be complementary or counter in in one passage. You need to look for the theme. You've got to do a cross-reference. Yeah. There's repetition here. What is the theme? What is the scriptures? What are the scriptures somewhere else saying about this? Mm. That is where you'll get your understanding. And by the way, you mentioned repetition. Nobody does this anymore. You, know, you, you get your little cracker for the day, your verse for the day, and you move on. I told my kids, we have eight children. Mm. I said, you were born to lead because you're born to reflect the image of God. And how you do that is through influence of others through servant leadership. Mm -hmm. I don't mean top down. And the only way you can do that is to develop these rhythmic disciplines Mm -hmm. that no one around you has. It takes you to the head of the class without you even competing with them just Mm -hmm. by being who you are. Mm -hmm. That's so good. That's so good. What have been some main obstacles for you, just the main obstacles to a scripture formed life? What, what do you foresee with others in your ministry? You've been a pastor for years. What do you, what do you see as the main obstacles? Humanism and passivity. Mm. Humanism assumes the doctrine of inherent goodness, that we're good people. I may lose some listeners here. <laughs> None of us are good people. Mm. Right, and I know, I've heard you preach it. We are born in original sin with total depravity. The majority of Christians don't believe that anymore in the American church, so they buy into the heresy of inherent goodness. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a good person, and therefore, <clears throat> I can interpret it the way that I want, and what happens is people spend more time reading books about what other people think about the scriptures than the scriptures to find what settles and seems right in them. Just like the serpent said to Eve, look, God doesn't want you to know this stuff. Don't worry about that. If you take of that fruit, you'll be just like him, and you'll know the difference between good and evil. You know everything. And so I hate to say it, but there is an arrogant humanism in the church where because we don't submit to that fivefold authority from Ephesians, we think we know everything. Mm. You couple that with your self-deception, there's no motivation to read. The other is passivity. Never has there been a more convenient time in the history of the world than right now. You get everything at your fingertips. Mm. I probably never have to leave my house here. I can just shop online for everything. Mm -hmm. And except for meetings, that that's it, right? And everything is right there for me. That's not the life Jesus promised us, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And passivity has destroyed the fathers of America mm. who sit back and turn their children over to other value masters instead of imparting to them their core values because there's too much entertainment. Yeah. Or I worked hard today. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit in my recliner Mm tonight. Give me a break, man. I have provided for you. I'm getting on one of my soapboxes here. Mm -hmm. Anyway, passivity is letting things happen. God is the covenant initiator. Jesus invaded a fallen world that hated him. Mm -hmm. Didn't blink. His, His emotions had nothing to do with it. He took the initiative. Paul invaded the known world at the time. Peter did. 
Those are examples for us. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be initiators in mm -hmm. life, including initiating the desire or the building of an appetite for scripture. Mm -hmm. If you don't initiate that, you'll never get there. But the passivity in us says, I'll get it from the preacher. Now, you're going to be provoked and instructed from the preacher, but then how are you going to digest that meal? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think of how sad it is that people want a new law. You know what? Yes. Moses can go up to the mountain and then bring me down. I, I don't want to do it. Don't give me a spirit that tells me to read, to be intentional, to come away, my beloved. No, no, no. I'll listen to Josh. I'll listen to a podcast. It's so much easier. And I think we, we forfeit our inheritance. So what do you do though? Because I just, I felt this way. I felt stuck reading the Bible to where the words aren't jumping like they used to, or I get bored. Hmm. And how I've always kind of interpreted it is that I was born in death, original sin, mm -hmm. that when I became alive to Christ, things that were alive um, to me, which was the ways of this world, all these different things, those things used to be life. Now they're death. And the word of God that used to be death to me is now life. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is because we live in the almost and the not yet. Right. There's times to where I read this book of life and it's just a book of death. Mm. And how, how, how is that transposing as in Colossians, it says you have transposed us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of life. Sometimes we feel stuck in, in between. Yeah. I think dry times have a divine purpose. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when God puts me in the desert, where is he leading me to death or to the oasis? By the time I get to the oasis, I am so thirsty for whatever he has for me that it's like I've never had it before. So I would say that part of the time, that is what's happening. Part of the time, I think we really need to ask ourselves, how am I reading? Going back to what we've really been discussing mm -hmm. And is this even what God wants me after? Like, maybe I'm digging in the wrong well here. I should be in Revelation when I'm in Mark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to prayerfully consider where are we reading, why are we reading it, and then the how. Mm -hmm. How are we reading it? Do we Are we reading with understanding? You know, James, <laughs> I love that guy, the Apostle James, mm -hmm. who wrote the, the, uh, the epistle. They called him James the Just, and they said that his knees looked like the knees of a camel because he was praying so much. But he meant his no words, right? Verse 2, hey, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. You think the guy is a lunatic, but he is showing us that adversity is a gift. Mm. And I think our mentality is it's not always supposed to be on the mountaintop. God wants us in the valley at times to strengthen us to climb. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You and I have talked about me in my own life having the dark night of the soul mm -hmm. two different yeah. times yeah. in my life. And it was very difficult through things outside of my control that happened. And during that time, I had to keep preaching. And I wondered, wow, you've got to be kidding me. How am I going to get anything out of the book? And God showed me something there, Josh, and maybe this will help when you're in these dry times. So my, my pastor said, just stay faithful to the word, even if it's not alive to you. And at the time, it just, I was struggling. I had a couple of people come up to me probably four months into this series I was doing about Jesus, of all things. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, this is changing me. And I thought, you've got to be kidding. How can it be changing? I don't even know if I'm saved anymore. <laughs> he said that jokingly. So I think God has a purpose in those. And I, we should not beat ourselves up and we should not quit. Mm -hmm. but change it up a little bit. Change up your routine. It's okay. Yeah, no, that's great. That's really great. Well, you kind of made a little mention of the dark night of the soul, which I think is really true. I've experienced it. Have you ever doubted the Bible? Because I know that you've studied a lot and you've been a pastor for a very long time, but have you ever doubted the Bible or has it always been just kind of a journey of discovering trust? Hmm. That's a big question. I'm going to give you a simple answer. Now, I'm a guy that, that Jesus rescued out of a vile, evil life where I knew I was an evil, wicked man. It's not like I had to be convinced, yeah. all right? I had a Damascus Road 
mm-hmm. conversion experience. It was it was the stuff that movies are made of. Personally, if I were God, I would have never saved me. Mm-hmm. Okay, he's a complete loser. <laughs> So I, I'm being honest with you here. Every day I'm amazed that Jesus saved me, Josh. Mm-hmm. I've never lost that amazement, and I can only attribute it to his grace reminding me of those incredible mercies that I never deserve. So I would have to, in all honesty, say I've never doubted mm-hmm. because I was lost and now I'm found, mm-hmm. and I have this treasure before me, and I just I can't let it go, mm-hmm. even in the rough times. Yeah, where else will you go? He's the one with the words of eternal life. Absolutely. And I'm not saying that people don't struggle with this, right? But faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God, the irony. If I'm struggling with trust and I'm not reading, I'm going to struggle more with trust. Mm, Yeah. No, I think that's so huge. I, I, I love this idea. I forget where I heard it from, but every time I have exposed my doubt to the word of God, Mm. My faith grows. Mm. But the problem is, is when I don't, when I don't seek out with my doubts, it kind of takes over me. And so I think, yeah, I think that's a, it's a, it's a really important. Outside of the Bible, what book has been most profound and influential in your life? Now I'm going to talk about, to me, the greatest American theologian. The two greatest were, in my opinion, mm-hmm. Jonathan Edwards mm-hmm. and R.C. Sproul. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dr. R.C. Sproul passed away a few years ago. I have been an avid student of his mm-hmm. for many, many, I mean, 30 years now. I've devoured so much of his teaching and training, his coursework. And he wrote a book called The Holiness of God. And nothing in my life has had an impact on me like that. And I have read it, I don't know how many times. I just read it again recently, toward the end of last year. Again, it took me to my knees. Again, it awed me. I cannot recommend this book Mm. enough, Mm. especially for heads of households. Because if you don't fear God, why would you expect your children to? But there is this joyful fear you get from reading the holiness of God. Mm. You know, this conundrum that only God can solve, that you're joyful and fearful at the same time. Spectacular book, not long. Cannot recommend it enough. Mm. Awesome. That's awesome. So if someone has never studied scripture before, what should be their very first step? They should call you. (laughs) I mean it. (laughs) They They should call you and say, hey... I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Like, what Bible do I buy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would need coaching. You know, everybody says, oh, send someone to the Gospel of John. Sometimes chapter one of John has a mystical edge to it, right? right? Right. I mean, Uh we're still trying to figure Mm -hmm. out the logos. I would say be simple and be practical. Mm -hmm. I would start in the beginning with the book of Genesis. Get a... Simple study Bible, a translation they can connect with, but then also someone they can speak with about what they're reading. Mm -hmm. So when they're driving off through the (laughs) guardrails before they get to the exit, you can help them fix the car and get back on. Because inevitably it's going to happen. You're brand new. But too many people are just, here, take this Bible and go and read. Just go and read. When I was, you know, studying statistics, for example, not a real fan of that. Mm. If the prof said, here, take this book, textbook and go and read it, I'll see you in three months. I'm getting a D in that class, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So they should come to you or one of the leaders and say, help me get on the right path here. And then take the journey we've been talking about with simplicity. That's great. That's great. Well, what what about for more mature Christians? Um, People that have been, you know, walking with the Lord, have their routine, their Bible routine, whatever. What should their next step be for Bible study? So I would say, how different am I today than I was a year ago from what I'm reading Mm -hmm. and how I am reading it, Mm -hmm. right? How is it renewing my mind? Not just making me feel closer to Jesus Mm -hmm. because that only goes so far. When you're in a bad mood, you don't feel close to Jesus. He's not gone anywhere. It's me. Right. That's not what you measure it by, but is your mind being renewed? 
Mm-hmm. So how do I understand a biblical worldview now more than I did a year ago? Mm-hmm. Very simply, do I understand the origins of life? Do I understand hierarchy? There's always some kind of change, chain of command. Do I understand uh, the principle of authority in light of that? Fourthly, do I understand ethics by which to live, not just personally, but civilly if I'm running a business or um, teaching my family or I'm in law school? It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Uh, The scriptures cover that. Fifthly, what is the purpose of the human race on earth? Sixthly, what is the plan to get there? Seventh, what is my role in it? How am I training the next generation to get there? Mm. So I just summarize that. If you have not developed answers to those questions, you don't have a biblical worldview yet. You have uh, a view of life that has some biblical wisdom to it. You have religion and not revelation. Oh, why didn't you just say that, Josh? Save me that answer. (laughs) All right. um, This is one of... My, in, I'm, I'm interested in personally is what is your favorite portion of scripture or maybe your favorite Bible verse? My favorite Bible verse, this goes back to my so appreciating the mercy of God, Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. It is of the Lord's mercies. I'm quoting King James because that's where I first memorized the, the, it. Exactly. That's the one Jesus read out of too. So. <laughs> It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O Lord. Every single morning I quote that. No, I'm not a Pharisee with repetitive prayer. This is the holy word of God. And every morning it just opens my heart to thankfulness to the mercies of God. I I can't tell you what that is meant to me. Now, my favorite passage or my favorite chapter in the Bible, Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2. Mm. We were dead in our trespasses and sins like every other loser on planet Earth, even fellow Yankee fans. (laughs) But, and this goes back to Lamentations, when we were dead in our sins, God in his infinite mercy made us alive in Christ Jesus. Mm. And of course, he's talking there about regeneration or the new birth, which is step one into salvation. But again, mercy is not getting what I deserve. Mm. Grace is getting what I don't deserve, right? So I live by this profound appreciation for the mercy of God because I still ask the Lord, now why did you save me? Seriously, I would not have picked me. Our amazement is in the wrong place. Why doesn't God save everyone? We should be saying, why did he save me? And those, that chapter, and then that one passage, and then, of course, the entire book of Romans, like I said. If I were on an island somewhere, and I can only take one book, it's Romans. Love it. Yep. Me too. Well, lastly, we've, we rounded third, and now we're heading home (laughs) to use baseball. Any final thoughts or encouragements on scripture? It's the greatest food on earth. Mm -hmm. It is the most digestible. Your soul will assimilate every nutrient in it. It will change you from the inside out. It just takes time. I guarantee, guarantee anyone listening to this that if you were to take seriously what we've discussed and read the scripture with a bent torn understanding, in other words, some degree of exploration and study, you do it every day for 30 days, you watch what's happening in your life. It will change you and begin to change others around you because you will become an influencer and a servant leader without even trying. That's how powerful it is. Mm, That's amazing. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jerry Tallow. Thank you. Love you. It's a privilege to be here with you. Love it. Love you too, brother. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rhythms Podcast by Everwell Church. For more spiritual practices and rhythms, visit online at www.everwellchurch.com or download our Everwell Church app for Apple or Android.